Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Scott Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. And we're team teaching today. We are. And we're excited. Give my wife of 26 years a big old hand clap. Now I got, I didn't do this in Scottsdale, but um, you know how they have Google translators and you can help, you know, figure out what people are saying who speak a different language. And the one thing they don't have, because we know men and women speak a different language, they don't have a translator for that yet. (laughs) So I want you young men out there to uh, take some notes, because you may have to be married many years. Nobody's going to teach this, but this is going to give you some answers. So if your wife or girlfriend says, and you say, hey, where do you want to eat? And she says, I don't care where we go to eat. The translation for that is, I care a lot about where we go to eat and actually have some very specific preferences about where we need to go. I just need you to start naming restaurants. Make sure you name the right one within five attempts because I'm getting hangry. Come on, somebody out there. Now, let's say she says, and this is a tricky one, guys, do whatever you want. See, the married guys already know. Well, you're like, oh, good, I'll do what I want. No, no, it means the opposite. It means don't do what you want, do what I want, or there's going to be trouble. Write that one down, that's a big one. She says, I'm almost ready. So when you first get married, you go sit out in the car for an hour. It means kick off your shoes, watch a show, it's going to be a while. And if you ask her what's wrong, and she says, nothing. You're like, okay. No, she says this. This is a translation. Actual. Did you seriously ask me what's wrong? As if you don't know. Everything is wrong. Everything. Be afraid. Be very afraid. You know, I don't have a witty, funny joke to share with you today, but I just would answer to every single one of those questions. Choose very carefully. (laughs) Choose very, very carefully. So we're continuing on from the marriage conference, but in such a way that it involves everybody because relationships are for all. And uh, life is about them. At the end of your life, it's not about the stuff you got and you bought and what you had. It was about the relationships and the memories that you created. You were designed for this. And so as we talk about men are monster trucks and, and women are like Ferraris in a sense, we're trying to give you the tools that you need to respond to friends, to respond to parents, to respond within, of course, your relationships, your boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband, wife relationships, how and understand kids? how to navigate. Your kids. Your kids. So when I think of male, when I think of man, I, I think of truck. Now, believe me, I'm not so simple-minded that I don't know that there aren't all v- types of truck, just as there are all types of man, all types of male. But the word says that God created man, he saw that it wasn't good, and so he made a helper. How did we get there? That's, well, not, that even, just that's not even in the notes. That's pure inspiration from God. Okay. <laughs> no, but he I, made man, Okay, but, and it wasn't good. Yeah, we're the finale. You are the finale. Amen. Ferrari, finale, yes. finale, Ferrari. Okay, but really, seriously, I, yes. There's all different type of man. I have four sons. I get it. Every one of them is very unique and very different. They're all very strong in in and of their own personalities. I have some that are more sensitive than other. I have some that are just, you know, plow through it. And that's kind of that's kind of the some of the simple character differences that you might find in male man. And the same is true of female. There's many personalities of female. My daughter is being raised to be strong and to be bold. But man, she's so feminine and foofy. She's so girl. And so when I think of male, even amidst all the different personality types, I still think truck. I think single focus. I think um, get it done. I think just plow through it and just go for it. I think sometimes, you know, rough and tumble, get dirty. Um, I do. I, I think, but they, but trucks can be sleek and they can, you know, dress up and look hot and nice yeah. and put together, right? <laughs> no, that's not meant for you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, you do, you She's are. About me. <laughs> 
just trying to show that as we navigate and as we go through our life, that we, it's not just, we can't put each other in a box, but at the same time, if you put all four of my boys in a line and you plop my daughter down in it, it there is differences. There are similarities between all four of them, even amidst all their crazy differences. And yet there's that similarity in, the, in, in all four of them that sets them apart from her even with her uniqueness, even with her having bold and strong character qualities and character traits. And so it's awesome to know that while we're created unique and different, there are some similarities that say male. There are similarities within women that say female and feminine. And it's important for us to know as we walk through relationship, whether it be with our spouse, whether it be with my mom, my dad, my children, my best friends, my siblings, it's important for us to know. Men haul it, give it to me, give me the low. But women are Ferraris. They're sleek, right? They're, 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 they're hot, can I say that? Right? Women are, they, they were designed differently. They handle life differently in a way. They, they can handle corners and roads and they can go and do and they, they can take off with an idea so fast and they can handle multiple things all at one time. Ladies, you can do so much as a Ferrari. Men, we run it over. Women, you're like, my wife can do so many things at one time. You know how many things I can do at once? One. I can do one thing. I come in, especially when the kids are little, and she's changing a diaper. She's cooking the dinner. She's helping another kid with homework, building a volcano or something. She's doing with the dog, and she's talking on the phone and praying to somebody, all while doing some sort of uh, crafty thing all at the same time. Me, on the other hand, I'm like, everybody leave me alone for 30 minutes. Dad is going to toast a bagel. I need 30 minutes. <laughs> Leave me alone. There's a difference between men and women. Even I noticed it just the other day with the kids. Uh, Savvy and Peyton were bringing in the grocery. And here comes Savvy, little you know, ponytails. And she's got two bags. And she had tied the tops of both of the little bags. And she was carrying them in with a big old smile. And then you hear down the hallway. And it sounded like a herd of buffalo were fighting. <laughs> I wonder what's going on. And I see Peyton, he's got 18 bags. Everything left, carried, falling over. That's what a, a truck, he's just hauling it. It doesn't matter. I'll come back here. Whatever drops out, I'll come get it back. And this is the difference. And what we want to show you here in Ephesians, uh, go with me to Ephesians 5. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. I think sometimes this is why, like, with women, you know, we are such multitaskers. And I think that sometimes when we're with our friendships and with our friends, you know, we can be doing five different things and, and understanding that they've got their five different things. But it's what we do. It's how we do it. It's how we roll. It's how we move. And, but yet you get married and you have a spouse and all of a sudden you're like, dude, why can't you think like this? <laughs> And that's a key part because you, you sometimes feel like, gosh, my best friend knows me better than you know me. But you know what? It's because of that similarity in personality. We've got some similarities. So, sorry, go back to no, Ephesians. No, I love it. <laughs> Where Ephesians. were we headed? We were headed we'll to, go Ephesians. to Ephesians 5. Um, in order for a vehicle, what's the most important thing is the fuel. Fuel is what moves, what gets movement. And I think for many of us, and you may feel this in friendship, you might even feel it in your job, you might feel it in, in boyfriend, whatever relationships in your life could be with your parents, be with your kids, that sometimes it feels like it's not moving. It feels like we're not going anywhere. And what we want to show you today is how to fuel up. You're a fueling station, in a sense, to your friendships. A fueling station even maybe for your parents. You could be a fueling station for your employees or for your boss. That when I realize what fuel that they take, that it allows me to understand what they do, why they do it, why they responded in the way they did. But then it also allows me to get some fuel into that relationship so that the relationship can begin to move to where God wants it to be. And so we see here in Ephesians 5, it breaks it down for us, men and women. Uh, he, he says, you know what, here's what you got to do. Men, he said, must love, not think about it, not maybe. He says, you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. And so in the midst of this, we find out that there's fuel for each of us. We've got the diesel for the, for the truck, and we've got the high octane for the Ferrari. Whole different fuel. They come kind of from the same, right? They both come from oil. Just like this all, you're like, well, it kind of are the same, yet there's a difference in the fuel. You, 
necessarily don't want to put diesel in the Ferrari and you don't need to put high octane in the, in the uh, monster truck. But we find the two difference as we turn them around. For the ladies, they need what? We love. You know, <laughs> as a woman, I think we just, um, I know, well, I know, I know for a fact when it comes to romantic relationship, when it comes to my husband, I just want to be accepted. I want to be loved. I just, that's how I get fueled up is when he loves me. Now, as I was, as we were talking about this team teaching, I thought, you know, but that extends into really what fuels me is love from my kids, love from my family, love from my friendships. I think when women, when, when our friendships are rocky or we feel like there's contention or there's strife there, it's a lack of love. And so I think it really lays us out because we are fueled by being loved. And here's an important key to understand, loved for who we are, just as we are. Knowing that I'm headed into being someone different, knowing that I have a list of things that I want to change about myself, but it's not happening all at the same time and all right away. We just want to know that we're accepted. We want to know that you choose us just the way we are while also being willing to celebrate when I change. Getting excited and, and helping and, and encouraging me on those things in my life that I do want to change. And the same goes for the relationship with my spouse. Is I, I want to know that he chose me from the very beginning with all of the junk and all of the awesome. I want to know. It fuels me. It makes me feel confident. It makes me go out into the, to whatever I have to do in my day knowing that he chose me just as I was. But in that environment, it frees me up now to go and make the changes that I have picked out and know with God speaking into me that I need to change. An environment that is safe is an environment that will allow change to, to happen and to stick. But it's so powerful for a female, it's so powerful for the woman heart to be able to walk through what we're walking through, whether it's job or destiny, or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, and just be accepted and loved for who you are. A man's a little different. We need some diesel. Somebody say diesel. diesel. We need, yeah, I hear the guys. We need some diesel, which is respect there. Respect is the fuel that drives a man. A woman wants to be loved for who she is. A man wants to be loved for what he does, meaning that he's honored and respected for the things that he accomplishes and he does in this life. And the fuel for us is the words of encouragement that build us up, that say, man, good job. That is great. That is awesome. You feel, you know, a monster truck, when it's fueled up, can run over anything. It can go over any other trucks, and, uh, mountains and, and mud. And it, it'll run it over. But a monster truck that doesn't have any fuel in it can't even go over a speed bump. And so oftentimes men can find themselves not able to really go and attack their day and not be able to accomplish things. And what this man really needs, it doesn't need to find out more things that are wrong with him. It doesn't find out the things that he fell short on. What he really needs is some people in his world to say, you're awesome. You're amazing. God put good things in you. Just like you do when a kid fails maybe in a sporting event, right? You, you, you don't keep beating them up all the way home. Instead, you go, you'll be fine. You know, that was a mistake. You know, you'll pick up and we'll do, you'll do great in the next one. And it's that encouragement that gets them to still love the game. And men want to love the game of life. And what they need is people around. Your dad needs someone that comes up and says, Dad, you're an amazing dad. You know, when Savvy comes up, she came up a couple days ago. She gave me a little kiss. And she goes, you're the best dad in the world. I'm going to tell you, baby, what do you, you want a Ferrari? What do you want, baby? I'll get you whatever you want. There's something about that that energizes you. There's something about those words of someone getting behind you for your sons in your life, right? For your friendships, your, God, your friendships out there, the different relationships when they got and they feel like they got somebody in their corner and they made their mistakes and they, they messed up and they, they, something bad in life happened but they got people in their corner says, you can do it, stop it. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is inside of you. You can overcome this. This is not a big deal. I don't care what the doctor says. I care what God says. And you begin to, come on somebody out there, you fuel up. You fuel that man up because a man that is fueled up, there's nothing in this world that will stop him. 
but a man that's unfueled, the world will overtake him. And so let's be those. I love the example. I, I said this at the marriage. I, I just got to put it in here also. Though, yeah, well, he just, you know, Pastor, he, I don't know if he's doing much right now in life. That's all right. You encourage him. It is not much. And he'll begin to do much in your world. He's just working at the Burger King. That's all right. You get up tomorrow morning and go, my man works at the Burger King. And he is the Burger King. Nobody makes a Whopper like my man. No one makes. Man, you drive all over town for him. And you build him up. And it won't take long. Before all of a sudden he's running the Burger King and he owns his own Burger King because he's got a group of people around him in his life that is filling him up and fueling him up. Okay, I want to interrupt you because as you're talking over there, I was thinking, you know, the more we know these, this information and the more we, I don't know, live to it ourselves, then the people that are in our inner circle or in our circle or sphere of influence, they actually start to take it, take it on upon themselves as well. And as you're talking, it was reminding me of, I love listening to my kids, I love listening to my young adult men, and how they talk about um, the friends in their lives, male to male, and how they're like, you know what, I told him, you can do that, you do have that inside of you. And seeing that relationship knowledge come out of them just in their friendships, just in the way that they encourage the people that are in their circle of influence and hearing how it comes out of them. And recently I had gone back and visited Heath in Nebraska and, and um, he had a big, you know, senior night. He's getting ready to graduate and he'll be home. And it was awesome to hear what the coaching staff and, and what some of the parents around him had to say and, and just that he likes to encourage and he loves to tell people uh, that they can go farther, his teammates. And I thought that's so powerful when we know what fuels the people closest to us in our lives and we know what fuels them up, it's just so awesome to watch them when, it, when it's affirmed Amen. and when people go and use it. And it makes change. It brings change. And just to be able to see the, the, the stature of people grow before your eyes when you operate and know how to fuel up someone to the very, very best possibility that you can, knowing that God does the rest. Turn to your neighbor and say, be fuel. Be the fuel. Be the one that gasses them up in the sense. Get them ready. You know, you ever encourage somebody, they walked away from you, you could tell you lit up their whole day. Isaiah 28, uh, 6 has been our scripture over the last four weeks, which says, God gives strength to those who win the battle at the gate. My battle is at the gate. And I had been talking about letting only positive in. But Holly made a, just a, a crazy good example this week of me. She goes, yeah, but the gate goes two ways. It also goes on what you let out. God gives strength to those who win the battle at the gate and make sure only the positive gets out, only the encouraging gets out, making sure that when people get around me that I'm the one that is encouraging and building them up at the gate. I had gotten a waffle maker for my mother-in-law for Christmas because I love waffles with all of my heart. <laughs> Everything about waffles. I grew up, we had waffles every Saturday. And I loved the waffle and it had been three months since I'd had the waffle. Uh, with a new waffle maker, because she got me an epic one, one that even Waffle House would be like, oh, wow, we need one of those. It was the <laughs> Waffle Nader 3000. I don't know what it was, but it was an epic <laughs> waffle maker. So I got up one morning, and I believe the, God was speaking to me that today is the day of the waffle. <laughs> the Andersons have a homemade recipe been passed down generations of the waffle. It takes some time. It's all from scratch. I build it all, get all the stuff done, right? And then here comes my wife. And she doesn't like the syrup. This is why, right? It's the syrup of breakfast. No, okay, so I don't like to smell like breakfast. I don't like to smell like bacon. I don't like to smell like a pancake. And I don't <laughs> want to smell like any of the sugary stuff y'all put on your breakfast. Now, when I student taught, little kids smelled like breakfast. And it just was my pet peeve. I don't want to smell someone's breakfast and not be having breakfast. Like, I don't want to smell like breakfast. And so it's not the maple syrup smell. You wouldn't even go in Jason's house one time. I would not. I would not. He came because over. It, wafting out of the front door. I think I got it on me just standing at the door. And he did invite me in because he's just like, a very gracious like, no, thank kind of guy. Did I said no? I'm gonna stay out here in the fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all go ahead and smell like breakfast. I'm gonna not. 
So waffles aren't a big thing. I think it had been actually a year since I'd probably had well, a waffle. it made you mad. And so I'm making waffles. She comes into the room, and Holly's really encouraging. Now, men, you have to realize that God put men on the earth to help us. He said, man's not good by himself. Give him a helpmate. So women's in their DNA is trying to make us better. That's what's in their DNA. It just comes out of them. Boys, understand your mom just trying to make you better. They're just trying to make us better. We're not good without them. We need them to make us better. So she comes in and she looks at the waffle maker and she looks at me and um, you could tell that her mind was calculating how to properly say this. Well, I would look, can I just say something? <laughs> this was like the fourth waffle making sesh. <laughs> this wasn't the first waffle making sesh. This was the fourth time in a row. I don't know if that's accurate. Who has waffles every day? Who can? Jesus. Jesus has waffles every day. I know that. That's scriptural. Nobody somewhere. should have Find waffles it. every day. And so we were on kind of a weekly waffle sesh and that's and then smelling like breakfast. But that okay, so I, so I helped your story here. Yes. Yeah. So she comes in she's all, what are you doing? And I'm all, I'm making waffles. Right? Because it's Shrek. Again. I didn't say again. And so she, she kind of looks at the waffle, looks at me, and she goes, you know, you really don't need waffles. I said it nice. She said it nice. <laughs> Please. But when it went in through the gate, TSA was not working that day. So... When it got all the way to the back, because sometimes you can't hear in the back, it said, hey, fatty, what are you doing? All right, that's what I heard. That's what I, I'm not saying that's what she said. I'm saying that's what I heard. No, I, I, I So then what's going to come out of my gate? Because I didn't know yet that I had to stop the gate. Because then the control in me takes over, and I'm like, I don't know who she thinks she is. So I go, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I can tell you this. I'm a grown-A man. And so... <laughs> I'll have waffles as often as I want to have waffles. I'll eat them all the time. And I said, just to show you this, so that you have this example to take with you the rest of your life, I will eat a waffle every day for the rest of my life. Man. And when I make promises like Watch this, the I, gate, I, I, I stick with it. Yeah. So I had a waffle every day for six months. Six months and 27 pounds later, I had taught her a lesson. <laughs> He doesn't know that I replaced the flour with coconut flour. <laughs> so, anyway, I've learned about the gates. So this last week, because uh, we're on keto right now, so we're, we're in prison. And so we're, um, <laughs> no, no bread, no sugar. And so she's in Nebraska. And so when I was shopping for food for the kids, it was, and I'm, I'm not sure, but I believe that heaven was calling me down an aisle. I hear, oh, and I turn. <laughs> And the angels were down the bread aisle. I said, come on down. And I walked right over to the artesian bread, the bread that is made by the angels. And I felt like the Lord spake upon me and said, by the bread, I am the bread of life, but this also is the bread of life. I don't know exactly what his wordage was, but it's something like that. I grabbed the bread and I took the bread home and we partake of the bread while she was in Nebraska. <laughs> then she came home. And the bread was kind of hidden in the back. No, the bread wasn't hidden. The bread was very, in all its glory, sitting on the counter in the pantry. And all I could think of was, that's what they ate for dinner. Every that's all night. we did. That's they all we did. Bread. I, I, bread it up. I, I, I really bread believe, everything. yeah, I, well, I believe he just I brought the loaf the out and said, get it. We rolled in it and, and they, then ate it. Yeah, I think they just sat in it. They, they, I think it was snack time. I think it was dinner. I think they ate it for lunch. I mean, they bred it. So much bread. So anyway, she's all, hey, did you buy bread? And, you know, as the man of the house, the kind of running things, I'm like, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe one of your kids bought the bread. I don't know. But I'm watching my gate, right? And she's like, you know, and we've been talking for about a month now about Beach Body Scotty for the summer. So we're working on Beach Body Scotty. She's like, so that's the goal, Beach Body Scotty. And so she goes, she goes, what happened to Beach Body Scotty for the summer? And so, and I didn't have the heart at the moment to tell her that the goals have changed. 
That it's no longer like we're not really aspiring for beach body, Scotty. We're going more of a salt river tubing, Scotty. <laughs> A little, it's, it's a little bit, but it's still, a, it's a good Scotty. I love Scotty in all his glory. It doesn't matter, beach body or salt river. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29 is, uh, I love this scripture right here. Ephesians 4.29. This would be one of those, I would keep in front of me. When you talk, don't say anything bad or negative. Well, I just got to get it off my chest. No, you don't. But say the good things that people need. Not what I need to say, but what they need. Whatever will help them grow stronger. That's what fuel does. Then what you say will be a blessing to those that hear you. Um, about a year ago, I had seen on one of the social media sites this app. And it was advertising the test of three. And many of you may be familiar with the test of three. I started doing some digging because I was curious about its origination. I wanted to know where it came from, who originally said it. There was like some kind of a hint or a rumor that Plato had started it, but then that got debunked. And so suffice it to say, I don't know. But I actually really like what this test of three says. It says three statements. It says, before you say anything, before anything proceeds from your mouth, ask yourself these three questions. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it helpful? Now, I found it really fascinating as I got on some of the boards, like the discussion boards, um, in, the, in my quest to find out where it originated at. Um, I found like discussion boards, and it was so interesting to see the opinions that would get on there and say, well, I would, you know, I just think this is dumb, or I think that, uh, you know, you have to pick the right combination for it to work. I mean, they really take this really seriously. I actually think it's fabulous. If we are to be word followers, if we are to follow what Christ says, what God says in his word, I actually think the test of three is a really fabulous thing to circumcise your words against. Before you say anything to someone, walk yourself through those three. Now, maybe you do come along some, you know, situation where um, it's not true, but it's out there. So maybe you do need to address it with somebody and say, hey, I just got to give you a heads up. This is what's being spoken. But we don't use it accusingly. We, we don't go and bash somebody based on this truthfulness that we're, you know, in the test of three. So it does have combinations that work. It has things that I think, I think all three are powerful. I think that when I say something to somebody, I do want it to be true. I want to believe it. I want to speak something that I believe about them, right? Is it kind? Philippians tells us. Speak kind. Is it helpful? That's a huge one. That's a massive one before you ever confront somebody or go into conflict resolution. You have to ask yourself, is what I'm about to do going to even produce a solution? And if it's not, you might just be wreaking havoc and making a bigger mess. Um, when I was dating Scott, because I didn't realize I kind of do this test of three. So when I was <laughs> dating Scott... He spent hours in front of the mirror. It was very obvious. <laughs> I don't know he was very meticulous doing. about his look. <laughs> but I'll never forget he picked me up and I was like, oh, wow. He wore the tightest jeans I've ever seen anyone wear. Because ladies like tight jeans. <laughs> he drove a sports car that was real low to the ground. I promise you, this is how he drove. Promise you. He got in the car, sat down, and it went. Yeah, because you couldn't bend the legs. I don't know. There was no bending to be done. I don't even know how he got out. I think he just scooted out of the car and he stood up. He just popped. <laughs> no one told I'm me that. I'm here to take you out. <laughs> no one sat me down and said, girls don't okay. like tight jeans. I know. I know. So that fell to me. That solution fell to me. But, I mean, come on. He's working so hard. He's so cute. Look at him. He's adorable. <laughs> And I thought he was so cute and adorable. I was head over heels. But the jeans just, they tripped me up. And every time I thought, if those jeans come on our date, maybe we could just stay in. Maybe we could catch a movie inside. <laughs> so one day, um, I don't know if I, I don't know if we were out shopping. Somehow no, you he said put on. we should go shopping. Well, somehow he put on a pair of Cavaricis. Right. Any you of you remember Cavaricis? We're 80s, we're 80s 
peeps. Yeah. So Cavariccis were like the big thing then, but they were very boofy. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> he put on a pair of those Cavariccis, and I had I couldn't even calm down how many compliments I gave him about those There's Cavariccis. There's so many. But I'm like, these I are about five sizes too on. small or too big. <laughs> I gushed about him. He's like, well, but they're kind of roomy. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> that looks amazing. I think that looks fabulous. That's the that's the in style. And he got rid of all of those crazy skinny jeans which are now back in style, but that makes me laugh, actually. <laughs> I think some people wear them skinnier now than you did, but I don't know. I don't, I were, don't see how they did. They were, they were me, very, here, very Here, guys, here's the secret if you're single. Here. Here's the secret to jeans. You buy them one size too small, then you wash them in hot water, and you put them on and let them dry to your skin. <laughs> and you know how you know they, they're just perfect? Is when you put change in your pocket, you can see the date on the coins. <laughs> That's how you know they're perfect. So the next time you're talking, the next time you go to say something, and I think that the test of three is a fabulous you test to so put yourself through, you know, when you are, especially when you have to have a difficult conversation. But I think it's a powerful test to run ourselves through just in daily conversation, just when we're having a conversation. And let's just be people that we really do watch that area of our personality in life. Your words are, I believe, the Bible talks about it, it's steering your whole life. Your words are like a hammer. A hammer can be used to build, but it also can be used to tear down. It's got multiple purposes. What does your words do? What does what you say do? Is it something that's tearing people down around you? Or is it something that builds them up? Is it something that encourages them? Does it make them feel like they can win? Does it make them feel like they can overcome? Does it make your friendships go, yeah. You know, when you leave somebody that tears you down, how many people know you're like, I don't know if I want to be around that person anymore. But when you leave somebody that builds you up, when they fuel you up in a sense because you are the fueling station. There's something different. Kids out there, if you walked up to mom this week and said, mom, you're such a great mom. I mean, you do so much for this family. I love you so much. Do you know that that would make mom's whole day, right? Moms and dads, you have the ability when you come down in the morning to hammer up something good in a sense, that you can encourage your kids that today is gonna be great, that you love part, you love them, you love what's in them, you love the gifts and talents, and you can encourage them up and fuel them up for the day. In the office, you can fuel up people that are around you. You can be the one that tears everybody down, and takes credit for stuff, or you can be the one that gives other people credit. And you build them up, because let everything that comes out of my mouth build people up. Let everything that I say bring encouragement. Make sure that I walk around in the Walmart, at the Starbucks, in the office, that everybody I talk to when I leave, I have fueled them up to go forth and be victorious in their day. Come on, somebody out there. Hallelujah. You know, I love every aspect of God's word. I love everything that he has spoken in his word. I love that he gives us the authority to then take it and speak it over our lives as well. Um, but how many of you know that there's different types of, uh, of sentences or di different types of statements, if you will, in the Bible? And wh while I love every aspect of the word of God, I love the statements that are declarative. Those are the ones that I can take, and when I speak them, they are applied to me. And my very favorite one is found in Psalm 19:14, And it says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation in my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh, my Lord. Lord is also translated in other translations as rock or strength. May it be pleasing in your sight. Oh, my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. I love that. May the words that I'm speaking and may what I'm thinking on be pleasing in your sight. Why is that important, like Scott was saying? Well, Philippians uh, tells us that we are to think on things that are virtuous and praiseworthy and trustworthy and good and kind and encouraging and filled with hope. We're to think on those things. Why? Because in Proverbs it says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. The heart is the wellspring of life. Out of my heart spring all the issues that I have in my life. Okay, well if it's the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, why is that important? Because somewhere else in Proverbs it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your words and my words have incredible, incredible power to create or to destroy. It has power to build up and it has power to tear down. And equally so, it has the power to affect anybody traveling in those areas of our building and our tearing down. 
anyone with us, it has power to affect them as well. We should be living our lives unoffendable. You should be living your life saying, it's all good, they said that, no big deal. Letting it go off of you, understanding people have bad days. We should be living life unoffendable, but we also should be living our life not offend, to not be offensive. Watching our speech, watching what we say, watching what comes out of us and knowing that it has tremendous life-giving, amazing, amazing power. So over in Proverbs 15, 1, it says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, when I think of that descriptor, when I think of something being stirred up, I get a picture of a hurricane. I think of this destructive, powerful, fierce force just going forward, blowing and knocking down, obliterating everything in its path. An angry hurricane. What if you and I took that energy that it takes to expend and be angry? I could give you five annoying things that already happened from the moment I woke up to standing here today. I could use my really cool descriptive words. I could get myself all worked up and I could obliterate every single, you know, make you feel all bad. I could. But why? We prolong situations when we speak angry and when we get frustrated and we allow the enemy to get us all worked up. You don't solve anything. You actually waste valuable time and now you have shorter amount of time. It doesn't, it doesn't, it just prolongs it. What if you and I chose or woke up every day and said, I'm going to declare happy words. I'm going to be a happy hurricane. I'm going to wake up every day and I'm going to create, when I walk in the room, I'm going to create a shift of happy that causes excessive smiling and excessive singing and excessive laughing. You can be a happy hurricane. I bet you have offices. I bet you have dance studios and gymnastic places and soccer fields that need happy hurricanes. You have the power within you through the meditation on everything praiseworthy and trustworthy and good and virtuous, you have it in your power. You are equipped to be the shift in the room. You have the power on the inside of you to send somebody off outside of your presence, ready to build something, ready to create something, ready to add the next floor to some amazing dream they've already begun. That's you and me and him. <laughs> happy hurricane. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a happy hurricane. Happy hurricane. You know when a storm is about to come, you can feel a change that happens in the atmosphere. Or you just feel a change. That's what you were called to do. You're called to be a change. You're called to be a something different. When you walk in the office, everything seems to change. They're like, okay, what's going on? You know what's going on? A happy hurricane's about to hit. It's going to hit that discouragement. It's going to hit that resentment. It's going to hit that anger. It's going to hit that frustration. It's going to hit it all. And what does a hurricane do? It knocks it all down. When you go to the next family gathering, you're the hurricane that brings happiness. When you leave, they're like, wow. I don't know what hit this place, but that was awesome. You walk into the Circle K and something different happens in the office with your parents, with your friendships. Wherever you go, you are the hurricane of happiness. Well, how do I do that? Because the joy of the Lord floods. What does a flood do? It just gets all over the place. I spill my joy wherever I go. It's just all over. It makes a big old mess. It doesn't matter if I'm in the Denny's, if I'm at home. You need to come down in the morning. Well, I don't know. Things are a little down. That's all right. I don't care where your parents are at. Why don't you be the happy hurricane for your parents when you come down? Sometimes moms and dads, you be the happy hurricane. We will be such a force of joy that'll go forth right here in Mesa that Mesa will not know what it hit it. Come on, Livermore Bible Church, let's be that. Be a force of encouragement, a force that builds up the men around you in your world, that you build them up with encouragement. You make them believe that they can win, and if they believe they can win, they will win. And the women in our lives, that they know that we love and accept them just the way that they are. We love you, we accept you, and we fill them up with words of encouraging, loving, and accepting words. Not words that tear down and separate, but words that build up and bring together. Let my words be. Only good words come out of my mouth. What people need. I'll bet you in here tomorrow when you get up, you can think about three things of the people in your world that they need to hear. Why don't you be that person that gives them what they need? 
be that light. I'm so glad that you're still watching. We're going to continue this on our Wake Up Show. It's a daily Bible study, Monday through Friday. You can go to YouTube and just search Daily Bible Study. You can find us. And what we do is we take what he teaches, what I teach, and we just go a little, we go farther with it. We it's do. a whole lot of fun. You can go to wakeuptv.tv and also there you could donate. You could give if you, if you receive something today. We just encourage you. To be a giver. Yeah, be a giver and sow back into what the Lord has poured into your life. Make Um, sure you always give to your local church. Yeah. But your offering, you can give so that it allows us to take this message even further. We got your super awesome, amazing Discovering Your Identity book. Incredible. It's on Amazon. It's, yeah. Yeah. And, and this is really about the confusion that's out there about people's purpose, about what they're supposed to be doing, direction, plans in their life, and really about who they are. Right. And so this is, it, it clears it up using scripture about who you are in Christ. So discovering your authentic identity, and you can search for this on Amazon. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity right now. It's very simple. It's very easy. Say this prayer with me and believe it in your heart and you have it. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't earn it. You can't somehow be good enough to do it. And so I know oftentimes the enemy wants to make you feel like, well, I'm not a good person or you don't know what I've done. But Jesus died for every one of your sins. Not some, but all. And I know that we all are still going to mess up, so don't even let that worry you. All that today is about is securing your eternity with a prayer. Say this prayer with us and believe it and you're saved. Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for forgiving me of all of my sins. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. You're in. You're in. God bless you. Uh, We just thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.